dog support system in the background with a new bow, and I think we're ready to go. Um, good news, it's Saturday morning and my alarm did go off um, and I was able to turn it off so it didn't have to go off every five minutes after that. I set up about uh, 38 alarm just in cases this morning because I didn't want to miss this one. So uh, um, it went off. Good thing is I was already up for about 20 minutes before. So um, very excited about this morning. Um, we are uh, uh, we got a, a fun one today. It is Saturday morning here. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm coming to you from under the porch. Uh, we are welcoming you to get getting back to zero. It's a place where we get to begin again. And I'm going to thank Kathy uh, for that little shout out. I really like that um, little thing. But uh, getting back to zero, a place where we get to begin again. Um, get to start our lives over again from a place where we're hopefully free of the chains that we carried for years. Um, from primarily alcohol abuse, which I did. So uh, glad you're here. I have not even introduced our guest yet, and I'm already seeing all sorts of messages popping up telling me to shut up and just let her talk. So I um, want to thank all the support from everyone there. So I uh, heard this crazy person um, with a very funny accent talk about on a Zoom meeting for TLC, the luckiest club of, I don't know, five months ago or so. And like everyone else uh, that was fortunate enough to meet her, uh, fell in love with her, her uh, was instantly inspired by her, and uh, was fortunate enough to be filled with um, a lot of hope about life's possibilities because of her. So uh, today we are celebrating um, a sober anniversary of hers. Today is 12 years for her. Can't wait to hear how she did it, what the journey was, but um, this is a guest that um, I, I, I'm so thrilled that, that she was is joining us today. Um, possibly um, she's been a major tool for me as far as with my sobriety journey. Uh, again, she just, uh, uh, her smile says it all, but wanna welcome Louise um, from across the pond, as they say, uh, to getting back to zero. Good morning, Louise, you there? I'm looking. I'm coming, I'm here. There you are, I'm hey. Here. Yes, yes, Well, Hello. Welcome, good to, good to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Lovely what to is be the? I, I know you're uh, the time zone. What? Where? What is your day right now? Because I'm at eight o'clock uh, Eastern time. One o'clock. Okay. So one o'clock so lunch time. How's the sober anniversary going? It's good. Uh, very quietly. Very quietly. Two teenagers who kind of go, "Oh, should we be celebrating this? Is it important? <laughs> is it important? I, I, is it important? I told my son's girlfriend yesterday afternoon why I what I was doing today because it was my sober anniversary, and she said, "Oh, that's amazing! Wow, well done!" And my son turned around to me and said, "Is that what we're supposed to say?" And I was like, "Well, yes, kind of, kind well, of." I thought, I thought it. you, it's a I thought you, cake. I thought you stopped celebrating <laughs> after like one or two years because because you got no. this. There's no need to you know worry about it anymore. You've perfected oh, this journey. Oh, don't go there! Don't yeah. go there! So um, I'm going to do what my um, wife and everyone else that's on here has been telling me to do, and that's just shut up and let you talk. But uh, I want to hear your story because I have not heard this. So um, okay. what got you here today? And I'm just going to sit back and listen. Okay. Are we, we going to hold you to that? I'm, I'm intrigued. No, 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 I'm intrigued by this. I know it's I'm, not going to last the whole time, is it? And, and, and if you go on for longer, and only people on TLC <laughs> will know this, but if you go on for longer than an hour and a half, I'm going to have to raise the little blue signal uh, to okay. let you know that you've gone over. But no, okay. go ahead. So I've got 90 minutes. Fantastic. I'll yeah. do my best. Um, so I always I always start my journey with, with the point of change. Um, it was the end of March 2009. I'd been out for a drink with some parents from school. Uh, I guess you probably have... Uh, parent clubs where you know parents get together to raise money for things and create committees and stuff and I was on one of those committees at school my kids were six and eight at the time um and we'd gone out for a drink to to do some work uh, the next thing I know is I'm I'm stood on a country lane looking at my car in a ditch and I I know I drove into it because I climbed out of it. I don't remember getting into the car, I don't remember putting the key in the lock, I don't remember driving out of the pub car park, um, don't remember driving it past any of the houses and any of the cars, but I definitely did because I'm the one that climbed out of it. 
and it completely freaked me out. Um, I went back to the house of somebody I'd been out with and he, he was an absolute star. He got on some overalls, he, he made, his wife made me a coffee, he got a rope. He said to me, um, and I will never forget this, he said to me, I knew I should have taken your keys off you and I can still feel how affronted I was at that statement he made, you know, regardless of the fact that I had just walked away from it in a ditch. I was so, so put out. Mm -hmm. How dare you? How right. dare you insinuate, insinuate that I should have had my keys taken off me? Um, and then, you know, and then he got me home. He got my car at the ditch. He, he told it, helped me get, get it back. It was fine. And then the next morning I, I got up to look at it and it was completely okay. There wasn't a scratch, not a dent, not nothing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know. But I, I felt so cold, so cold. Um, I mean, my drinking had always, you know, it's one of those things that had always been uncomfortable. It had never been a happy thing. It would always be an evening of not knowing whether it was gonna be a good night or a bad night. And uh, that was one of those nights. I, I drank to what I now know is called a blackout. Since I was 18 and a half at university, um, my very first drink in what we call Freshers Week had been a couple of pints in the bar with some girls I'd just met who I was going to be living with. Um, and then I woke up the next day to find this guy on my floor in his underwear with no idea of how he'd got there. I don't remember talking to him. I don't remember what his name was. I just woke up and found him there. And then that just kind of set a pattern. I've got no idea what I said to people. I've got no idea what they said to me. It was just, it was just what I did, you know? Every so often I'd go out and I'd not remember what I was doing and I would be a nightmare. I would be uncontrollable, unmanageable. I'd be vocally outrageous, never mind behaving in an outrageous way. I would be completely vulnerable with myself. So I would quite often end up with guys I didn't know in places I didn't know. Um, I've, I've slept on a park bench before. I have come home and not and slept on the couch and left the front door wide open on the main road, living with other girls. Um, I was just liability. Did people know that you were having these issues then or were you just considered the fun girl at that time? Um, I think people knew as to whether they really believed me when I said, I don't remember. I think people thought I was just covering my ass, you know, when I said I had no idea what I did or what I said, I don't think people believed me. I think people thought I was just, you know, pretending because I didn't want to face up to the reality. Um, and then I, I did this thing of going out with lots of different people. So I never went out with the same people every night. I would go out with different people all the time. So nobody, not no one person saw everything I did. I shared it. <laughs> I mm -hmm. very kindly gave it out to several different friends to you're have to kind, deal with the trauma of, of, of drinking with me. Um, you're a kind person. You're a very kind yeah, person to share. Living like that, living like that. Um, and so I don't think anybody called me out on it. And it wasn't really until that point when I was looking at my car that I looked at it. I just, I just refused to acknowledge that there was anything that I, I could do about it. It felt to me like it was just, you know, it's just me. I'm, I'm not very big. I can drink a lot, so I can take the volume. Um, I would quite often make myself sick so I could drink more. Uh, I, was, I was a pint drinker mostly when I went out, which is kind of like, a, I don't know, a part of a pint and half a litre. Um, and I, I could drink a lot. I could drink a lot and I could take it and I could go out for a drink with the boys. I drank mostly with men, um, not women, because women drank short, stupid drinks. And I didn't see the point of short, stupid <laughs> drinks because I just drank too many of them. So I drank with the boys. Um, I, you know, developed an attachment to the rugby scene. So we get to go out and drink all the time when you're watching a rugby match in the pub. It was just a perfect, perfect way of doing it. And all my friends drank, all my friends drank. Um, and not, I didn't really drink more than the people I knew. You know, so it was hidden. It was hidden from me, I think. And I never drank in the morning. I never drank to go to work. I never drank to do stuff. I'd never thought I needed it. It was only when I really started giving it up that I began to understand how much I needed it. 
Um, but that moment in the car completely freaked me out. Absolutely. And I, I suddenly realized, you know, I could, I could have killed somebody and it wasn't mm-hmm. that I could have killed myself. Cause that's not, that wasn't an issue. Um, people at the time, I quite often thought, had suicidal thoughts and thought that people would be better off without me. Um, I considered myself to be damaged goods, not to have anything worthy that was going to be of any benefit to my kids. So that actually, you know, if I disappeared, it wouldn't be a problem. But the fact that I could have made my children the children of the drunk who killed somebody else, that absolutely freaked me out, really freaked me out. So um, I started Googling what to do if you have a drink problem. Um, and I did it several times in different different combinations of words and each time AA kept coming up and I was just like oh, well this is nonsense because obviously <laughs> obviously I'm not an alcoholic because that would be crazy you know I mean an alcoholic is you know male old dirty uh, lives in the park wears a raincoat mm-hmm. as somebody once said talks to pigeons um, has a brown paper bag with alcohol in it I am, I am so far removed from that. It's, it's not true. So I'm obviously not one of those. AA, um, AA is the bottom of the barrel, but I, I, I'm up here. I just need to get a, a little program to fix yeah. this. I'm so not there I, yet. I'm just. Uh, I had no idea that the barrel had different depths. So for me, alcoholic was the complete dead end. Life is over. There is nothing and nowhere to go. Um, and I did not associate myself with that. So I, I kept Googling other things. And eventually I did the questionnaire. You know, that bit where it says, you know, answer these questions and, and we'll tell you whether you can help you or not. So I thought, well, this is, this is going to be the way, isn't it? I'll answer the questions. And this will be the end of, of this bit of, of today. And then I answered yes to the questions. Um, and I answered yes to seven, maybe two more. I got to the end and it said, if you've answered yes to three or more, you may have a mm. problem that we can help you with. And I was just like, what? Three? <laughs> you could yeah. be kidding me. I've obviously answered them wrong. Obviously yeah. answered them wrong. <laughs> I must have read something wrong. Right, let's do them again. So I did them again and again and again. And then I went away and came back and did them again. And and there are, there are moments in my recovery that are real turning points for me that I look back on with such gratitude. And the fact that I did not lie when I did that questionnaire, even mm-hmm. though I, I said maybe to two, which were obviously yeses if they're not no's. So grateful that I didn't lie because I know people who've lied when they did that questionnaire to get less than three. So I didn't get less than three. I stayed with my seven. Um, I realized I needed to go to a meeting then to absolutely decide it wasn't for me <laughs> because the questionnaire said it might be. So I was like, right, I'll go to a meeting. The meeting will tell me it's not for me because there was nothing else. You know, there was nowhere else to go. There was no social media thing. There was nothing. This was the only place where there might be an answer to what I just done. So had I went, you told, I went, had I went you to told anyone? Did you tell anyone this at this point? What, that I was going to go to? The yeah, had you confided anyone that where you were or what no, you were going to do no, or? No, okay. no, not at all. Um, I told my husband about the car accident um, and he was just mortified that somebody else had seen it and been involved. Um, and then the next day, well, a couple of days later, he'd bought me a big glass of wine for my birthday. And I, you know, I said, I, I think I'm, I'm really worried about my drinking. And he just said, you just don't know how to stop. That's all that's wrong. You just don't know how to stop. So I ran, ended up ringing the AA, helped line to find out where the meeting was. And this woman tried to talk to me about my drinking. And I remember just kind of shutting her down and going, I just want to know where it is. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. Go away. Leave me alone. I'm not in the conversation about your drinking or my drinking. Um, and then she arranged for somebody to meet me, which was then all even more mortifying because it was like, oh shit, I've got to go now. Somebody's going to be there meeting me. <laughs> so, I, so I turned up to this kind of like really obscure street in the middle of Marlborough and there's like a bunch of guys all stood outside smoking. And I was like, oh God, I'm going to start smoking if I can't drink. That's going to be the worst thing. And then this woman just kind of pounced on me. And uh, Louise, this is Louise. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> and I know. Again, you know, if I hadn't had her, I probably would have walked past because it was just too intimidating, too intimidating. 
Um, but she, you know, she grabbed me, got me upstairs, made me a coffee, sat me down, introduced me to people. And I was just, I, I, I didn't want to be there. I have never not wanted to be anywhere more, I don't think, than that point. And I was like, don't, this is not my life. And they were so chatty. They were all chatty, chatty, laughy, laughy. And I'm like, what are you not on? What is this thing that I've come into? You know, I've, I've not seen it in films. I have no idea. I had absolutely no idea what I was acting myself in for. I don't know how I've managed to avoid it in film and TV. I think my brain must have just switched off um, whenever it had come on. So I sat in this room with my legs crossed, my arms folded, my coat on. Don't talk to me. Go away. Don't look at me, face. And then, and then it was a woman that shared, you know, it was a woman who shared, she'd got 10 years sobriety. That was the first point at which I realized they'd all stopped drinking. Um, and I didn't understand that either. And if I'd known that, I would never have gone. <laughs> I would never have gone if I'd known that was going to, what they were going to be offering me. And she was, you know, upper class, very well, very good, you know, top quality background, the kind of life that you might aspire to like I used to in those days, but I don't now. And her story was just heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. Her kids used to wake her up with coffee and vodka and they knew to put vodka in the coffee because if they just gave, a vod just gave a coffee, it wouldn't work. And I, I just kind of sat there thinking this, this, isn't, this isn't it, this is not my life, you know? I'm 41 years old, I've, I've got so much more to be doing. This is, this is, this is the end. This is the end. This is the absolute end. This is not me. And I'm not, I'm not joining in with, with you lot. Uh, but somebody, somebody got me to go to another meeting the next night at which I discovered their God element. And at that point I completely turned off because I was like, right, I'm not doing any program thing. Nobody's telling me what to do. This sponsorship with a woman, are you kidding me? Um, and then God, well, you can take that um, and put it somewhere that the sun doesn't shine because it's, that's just nonsense, absolute nonsense. But I listened. And at the time, it's like you said, you know, did, could I confide in anybody else? No, I couldn't tell anybody else what I'd done. I was absolutely mortified, completely mortified. Yet these, these people were talking about all sorts of things, all sorts of things that were way worse than anything I'd done, way worse than anything I'd done. So I just kept, I kept going back. People gave me their phone numbers, but I ignored them. Um, I tried to stop drinking. Uh, we had, we had our, our last bottle of red wine. My husband went to buy a really lovely bottle of red wine to go out on. Cause I said, if I'm going to go out, it's going to be on a decent bottle of red. So we had our last bottle of red. And then a couple of nights later I had a beer and then he went away for a few days. And whilst he was away, I, um, I cooked myself supper one night. And I, I thought, you know, I'll just have, I'll just have a something. There must be something in the house that I can drink to have with dinner. And I found some vodka. So I had vodka and orange juice with my dinner because, you know, that's a go with your dinner drink, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and then I ran out of orange juice. So I just had vodka. And then I realised I drank half a litre of vodka in, a, in less than an hour. And I felt fine, right? Fine. <laughs> I wasn't even, my hand wasn't waving. I didn't feel sick or nauseous I felt fine and I thought nobody drinks half a litre of vodka <laughs> half of which I drank straight and feels fine that's just wrong right wrong uh, and then a couple of days later 17th of April I went to a meeting where a woman shared about how she'd been in AA for 12 years she'd come in similar age to me with house with kids with a job, life was functional. Um, she'd done 12 years sobriety, it'd all been lovely. Oh my God, she'd done 12 years, that's a coincidence. She'd done 12 years and then she'd stopped going to meetings. And then three years later, when she came back into the room, she had no job, no house, no car, no kids, no husband. She had the car, but she was living in it. She was living in this tiny little Ford Fiesta and drinking cans of lager. And I, I saw that. I saw that as a potential future point for myself. And that scared me. That's, that's when I realized I had a choice, you know? 
I had a choice and I had to make it. And whether I felt I could own that choice, I don't really know. But I, I just looked, I looked at death. I looked at death and I realized that actually, even though for the past kind of like 20 odd years, I had been dicing with death as my get out of jail free card, that I didn't want to die an alcoholic and I didn't want to die drunk. I didn't want to die in a gutter. I didn't want to put my kids through that. So I stopped. How, how long from the first, that first meeting or when you had the car in the ditch before you came to that, okay, I'm Three done. weeks. Okay. Three weeks. Three weeks where I was obsessed with it. It was the only thing I thought about. It was the only thing I thought about every day. Every day going to work. What am I doing? What am I going to do? How am I going to not do that again? I, I, it, was, it was all about how am I not going to do that again? How am I not going to ever do that in that car thing again? Because I don't understand how I did that. Do you I know what my, my, my dread of those three weeks, my three week period was not how am I going to not do the ditch? Mine was how the hell am I going to live a life without, without having yeah. alcohol? How am I going to face yeah. this? How am I going to get through life without my my beer i had that yeah, that completely. scared the hell out of me completely and i think that's what I, I was bouncing through i was bouncing around in that space of well i can't give it up i can't give it up mm -hmm. how am i going to watch a rugby match without it how am i going to eat spaghetti bolognese without a glass of red wine how am i going to do my daughter's wedding you know my daughter will get married there'll be champagne i mean she was six right she was six <laughs> but, but my head seriously jeff in my head in that very first oh, yeah. meeting Yep. Went to her wedding, right? Her wedding. There'll be this wedding, Louise. There'll be this thing. There'll be champagne. You'll need to go. You'll need to be there. You'll need to drink to be part of it. But I kept going back to that car. I kept going back to that car. And I'm like, I cannot do that car thing again. I cannot do that car thing again. And, th and then I stopped. And then, and then it became the obsession, right? Then I began to realize I had the cravings in a way I'd never had before. Uh, it just took over. I, I ate chocolate like... There wasn't enough chocolate in the world. I would hide chocolate in the house in case anybody took my chocolate. Um, I had a conversation with my husband about my excessive chocolate eating. He even approached my mother to say, you need to talk to your daughter about her chocolate, <laughs> her chocolate eating, because she's going to get fat. Nobody ever talked to me about my drinking, but let's talk about the chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, but I refused to do the thing, you know. I refused to talk in meetings. They tried to give me readings, and I would just say, no, thanks, I'm not reading. Uh, I refuse to say my name. I refuse to accept I might be an alcoholic. I just had to stop. Um, and then I, I went to a meeting when a guy talked about his car accident, which was way worse than mine. He'd ended up in intensive care. Um, he had no recollection of what he'd done. And I sat listening to this guy talking about his car accident. And I realized that whilst, whilst I was obsessing about alcohol and not drinking, my head had taken the car accident and moved it out of my out of my view over there and into the back and I had forgotten about it mm -hmm. absolutely forgotten about it and that freaked me out and at that point I kind of started joining in and kind of going right actually I, I have this thing I completely have this thing I accept I have this thing now I am powerless over it it has me my, my conscious thought and my conscious being is not enough to keep me from it because it has the power to make me forget about that car accident. And I am never, ever going to forget about that car accident. So I started talking. I started saying, my name's Louise. I'm an alcoholic. I started putting more money in the kitty. I started acknowledging my birthdays. Uh, I started talking to people. I started meeting them outside for coffee and stuff. And I just started to kind of step into the community, not into the program, but into the community. And, and it was that beginning of stepping into the community where I started to feel safer. And I started to feel that actually perhaps, perhaps there was something here for me. Um, and then it became the new thing, you know, so it was like four to five meetings a week. Um, I ended up going off sick because my body just completely dissolved into sleepness. Um, my brain stopped working. 
and I'd go to lunchtime meetings, evening meetings, I'd have coffee. It became like a new obsession. I hardly really saw my husband. Um, and then and then I had a really terrifying moment. Um, I was in the kitchen cleaning up one evening. He'd left out half a bottle of wine and it sang to me. And it, it was like that mermaid thing, you know, it called me across the kitchen, absolutely called me. My entire being was summoned towards that bottle of wine. You know, come in, Louise, come and have a little sniff. Come and have a sniff. A sniff will take the edge off. You just need the edge taking off. Have a sniff. And then I got near it. And as I got nearer to it, it kind of went, have a sip. You know you want a sip. Just a sip. And then, as I was kind of on the cusp of going to have that sip, I saw in the bottom of the bottle a dirty, slimy, smelly creature, a bit like Gollum out of Lord of the Rings, going, come here, my pretty, I want you. And I knew, I knew if I drank any of that bottle, that was where I was going. That was where I was going, and I was terrified. So I texted somebody, because I never called anybody, but I texted this girl and I said, oh my God, I nearly drank, I nearly drank. Um, what do I do? And she texted me back, you need to pray, Louise. And I'm like, no, seriously, this is really bad. <laughs> really bad. What do I do? And she just texted back, you know the serenity prayer, get down on your knees and pray. And I was just like, you have to be joking me, you know? For fuck's sake, prayer? Prayer to what? To what? What do I pray to? I mean, there's just nothing. That's just nonsense. But I did because I was scared, really scared. Um, and I got down on my knees. I can remember where I was. I can remember how awkward and uncomfortable and ridiculous I felt. And I said, you know, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. You have to help me. You have to help me. I cannot do this. And I went to bed. And then I got up the next morning and I did it again. And it changed. It changed. It was like, it's like that moment when you're, when you're driving past a lorry in the pouring rain, right? The rain's thundering down. You're driving past the lorry. Your windscreen wipers are going tenth of a dozen, but they're not quite clearing out the rain. But you know that if you keep driving, you will get past the lorry and you'll be able to see again. And it felt like I'd gone past the lorry. It was still pouring with wet rain. My windscreen wipers were going 10 to the dozen, but I'd gone past the lorry and actually I could breathe a little. I could, I could actually breathe. Um, and so I started really talking in meetings. I started sharing back. I would say, somebody would share and, and the minute they'd stopped, the minute they stopped sharing and it was open for shares, I'd say, thank you for your share. Uh, this is what's going on in my head. And I would let, I would let my head have my mouth and I would just go, this is what's going on. And, and slowly everything began to un unravel or kind of make sense from the unraveled chaos. You know, people talk about a washing machine head and full of words and sounds and images. And that's where my head was. And slowly, as I sat in meetings and said, this is where I am. This is what's going on for me. My life just started to slow down. And between that and prayer, I started to find myself living in a world that I could cope with. And that was just miles away from where I had been when I was drinking. Because when I was drinking, it was chaos it was busy I felt out of control I was constantly trying to fix things constantly trying to make things I was very aspirational it was, it was just everywhere whereas at that point it just began to make sense and I was like oh my god this is why people do this <laughs> this is why people do this I get it I get it this is this is how you live life right this is how you live it you you pray <laughs> you get in meetings you speak the shit that's going on in your head and it all becomes doable. Oh my God. So I, I did the step three prayer. Um, 
And then I ended up adding the France of Assisi Supra, um, sometimes associated with step 10. I found the sponsor, I started to work the programme, I completely and utterly, you know, I spent ages on step one, which I think is really important. I completely got my powerlessness over everything. I completely got my chaos, my unmanageability when I was drinking and before that. And then I did that thing of just going, right, God, have my life. Here is my life. Where do I need to go? What do I need to be doing? Give me the things that I need to be working on because I don't understand which of those bits I need doing today. And and it just happened. I, I became like this path where I would just do the things laid out in front of me. I would deal with my job, the way I need to deal with my job. The, some of the challenges that I had at work just disappeared. It was just, just amazing. You know, I, I had a project with like one of the most bullying sponsors going in the organization and I was, it was being handed over to me. It was my first big piece of work. Um, and the day after I took it on from the previous project manager, the sponsor got a new job and just vanished. There were people in my team I didn't get on with. They got different jobs. There was a piece of work that I needed to do and that I hadn't done. And the date changed. I mean, just, it was just honestly, it was beautiful, just beautiful. And I, I just kind of handed it over. Um, I had a, an issue after a couple of years where my sponsor relapsed. My sponsor relapsed. I realized I was on the edge of meetings. My head came back. I had an issue at work with some woman and I had loads of justified anger and issues with her and I, I behaved really badly. Um, and, I, I, and I had to get back to meetings. I knew I had to get back to meetings. And I sat in this meeting going, right, God, you need to help me get back into meetings regularly because I need to go to an AA meeting every single week because I have gone loopy and I, and I nearly lost it. And I'm really grateful that whilst I lost it mentally, I didn't drink, you need to help me get back. And they need a tea person. And you know what it's like they need a tea person. They say, oh, we need a tea person. Anybody want to do tea? Um, and it's generally a newcomer role. And I sat at the back of this meeting going, I'm not doing fucking tea. <laughs> Newcomers do tea. I've been sober for two and a half years. I'm not doing tea. And then the other bit of my head went, uh, tea, Louise, would be really good. <laughs> You'd have to come every week. You'd have to talk to people. Do tea. And I sat with the two parts of my head having this blazing row. And it felt like they were discussing tea for like half an hour while my head was arguing with itself over it didn't want to come every week and it didn't want to talk to people. And the other bit of me going, we need to be coming every week. We need to be talking to people. And eventually my hand just went up and I said, I'll do the tea. And again, one of those moments in recovery where, thank God, thank God I did that. I, I went back every week. Um, I then did secretary for another six months. Uh, I then took on treasurer. Somebody said to me, "You don't want to do treasurer. You have to come. For, you have to come every week for two years." And I'm like, "If I'm still in this town, why wouldn't I want to come every week for two years?" Oh my god, that sounds like the perfect thing to do. So I did that. Um, I've had several bouts of therapy whilst I've been doing my recovery and covering all the shit around my childhood trauma. Um, and, and clearing my way for that, I have become grateful for all the things I used to resent, all the things that made me angry. Every moment in my path, every, every moment, Every moment in my path, regardless of how painful it was, I am incredibly grateful for, because only because of all of that did I get to where I am today. And I love that. I love that I can sit with moments of pain because they are still painful and be grateful for them because I know I needed them to get to here. They're part of who I am. They're part of how I made my life the way it is. When I realized I needed to leave my husband 
because it wasn't safe for me. And I was five and a half years sober. And he was the love of my life. And I only married him and had kids with him because I thought it was forever. And I had to leave. <sighs> because he wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't make any changes. We were in the darkest, darkest place, financially, emotionally, physically, the whole thing was just awful. And I sat with God and I said, how, how do I leave? How are you, how can you ask me to leave him? How can you be telling me that this isn't gonna work? And it's that thing, you know, somebody, somebody wrote something the other day that we get signs from God. Um, first they're a feather and then they're a brick and then they're a house or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, yeah, you know, I had a lot of feathers and I had a lot <clears throat> of bricks and then I had the house moment of, you have to leave this man, Louise. You have to walk away. You have to walk away from your, from your family and your house and your kids because if you don't, you might drink again. And I, you know, I was paying all the bills. I had no money to, to rent anywhere else. I couldn't do anything else. He wouldn't talk about it. And then a friend said to me, you can come and stay with me for, for a month. And I kind of went, okay, I can come to you for a month, right. That can be my step. Um, and I can still remember, you know, sitting down with the kids and telling them I was going. And when I, when I left him and I did that, I had no idea if I'd ever see them again. I had no idea what he'd do. I had no idea what would happen. I had to put my complete, I put my complete faith in God that my path to leaving them would be the right thing for all of us and that he would hold me with that and that he wouldn't do something awful, but that if he did something awful, I would, I would be able to live with it. That was the hardest thing I have ever done. The great thing is he didn't do anything stupid. They are still here. Um, they did come and live with me, which I wasn't really expecting. So I ended up being a single parent full time with two teenagers. <laughs> and I kind of sitting with God and going, he didn't tell me this was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another hammer <laughs> thanks god for this one because this is hard uh but you know it's that thing of how amazing that i could do that how amazing that i can do this how amazing that i you know i i found a new home for us we furnished it with help from friends we started again you know i was i i, I've, I worked full time all through that time my daughter had a complete breakdown she's still building that back um just blows me away that I did that blows me away but I was helped you know he found he found me path the path every time you know I, I was staying with a friend this is my favorite favorite recovery story I was staying with a friend um the kids weren't living with me they were still with their dad I still had no money because I was still paying all his bills and I was sat in an AA meeting right a Saturday Saturday evening AA meeting and um there was somebody else in the meeting who joined who'd come into AA when I had but hadn't been able to get sober. He'd still been drinking, got serious pancreatitis, uh, in and out of hospital all the time. Um, and I sat in this meeting and I said, you know what? I find it amazing that I have no fear of financial insecurity because even though I have nowhere to live <laughs> and I'm living out of my car in somebody else's spare room, um, I know that God will look after me and I know that something's gonna be okay. At the end of this meeting, the guy turned around to me and he said, um, I might actually be able to help. And he, he rarely went to that meeting and he said, I'm about to go to rehab for six months. Um, I need somebody to house sit for me. It's fully paid for. All the, all the standing orders are covered. You, you just need to pay bills for your usage. And I was like, what? <laughs> he said, I've got two, two bedrooms. It's just down the road. Um, you know, it's like 10 minutes from your kid's school, half an hour from your work. Um, and it, I, I, I drove home from that meeting in tears, absolutely blown away. 
by timing and that that moment when god just went here's your next step louise here's your next step louise mm -hmm. and i and I've, I've had i've had those all the time you know all the time here's your next step louise here's your next step louise letting go of where i'm going the big plan and just going god will show me where i need to be what i need to be doing and i will just do what is asked of me and when i do what is asked of me it's just it's just beautiful you know i gave up work in september because i got offered redundancy i got offered the chance you know to write i'm writing my novel i'm two thirds of the way through it and because i got you know, and I got off of this redundancy thing. And then Laura started doing lunch time, you know, lunchtime in the UK TLC meetings. And would you like to do one, Louise? Well, yes, and I can because I'm not working. And look at what that has done. I mean, that's just been, oh, I am going to cry now. That's just amazing, right? Being part of TLC mm -hmm. has been the most beautiful experience. Humbling every single time blown away by the fact that anything that I say that has been passed to me or been my learning is, is helping other people. There is nothing, nothing more amazing hey, than I'm somebody one of those. in recovery. I, I, <laughs> I'm one of those people. Just blows me away. Blows me away. You know, I sat in those meetings for weeks going, I'm not speaking. I'm not joining in. I, I was... I was not allowed to speak as a child. I struggle. I've really struggled in the workplace to find my voice. And yet I sit in this space with, with you lot, just blown away by it, blown away by it. I feel so very humbled, so very humbled by that. And so what? I get to sit here on my 12 years, I know. 12 hey, these... whole, fucking years and you brought me balloons well the, these are you talk about god bringing you uh bricks these balloons he didn't bring me these balloons those are for you he he gave me plenty of bricks uh in life but i got a couple questions that um i have to uh and we will have um we'll put this in the chats um where links where you can rewatch this which i will be doing myself numerous times but uh so this can be rewatched at later times whenever you want. A um, couple of questions, and I'd probably lose an order here. When you went in the ditch, I, I talked with a, um, a person just this morning who's in that recovery, not recovery, um, yeah. and they have not put their car into a ditch. And what do you, what do you say to them? Because they have not, they, again, they haven't put their car in the ditch, but they know that they probably need to stop. How, how, how do you get that? What do you say to them before they do the ditch or something even worse? That's not there yet. Um, so I talk about my experience because that's what I know, yeah? So I always talk about my experience and I say, yeah, you know, I used to go to meetings and people used to tell me I wasn't an alcoholic in a meeting. I had a woman tell me I wasn't an alcoholic because I hadn't been arrested for drunk driving. And she'd been arrested three times for drunk driving. <laughs> three times for drunk driving and she still hadn't stopped and I kind of went I don't want to ever be arrested for drunk driving I love the fact I haven't yet been arrested for drunk driving I have done my shit you know I've done my shit I've had the pain and I am done with it and then I'd also say come to meetings listen listen to what other people have gone through who have gone further than you have done and the consequences that has had on them and the people around them. But then also listen to the people who are now sober. Listen, listen to the way they are living their lives. Listen to the things that are happening to them, right? Do you fancy some of that? Do you fancy some of that? Because let me tell you, right, I had absolutely no idea that any of that could be for me and I sat in meetings going I just don't want to feel like shit anymore I just don't want to feel like shit and I want to stop wanting to drink the rest of it all this stuff that you lot all talk about having you know life beyond your wildest dreams bollocks great fantastic that's not going to come for me and then that has come for me right 
the stuff that comes in sobriety, the lives that people get to live, the joy and the gratitude that people have for a way of living. The people I know in sobriety are the ones who have the happiest, most fulfilling lives. Why wouldn't you want some of that? Why wouldn't you want some of that? And I'll tell you something else, right? I tell her as well. There's a group of people who all want to help you get there. You're not going to have to do it on your own. Don't sit there and think it's going to be hard and how can I do it? Because there are going to be other people who will want to help you get there. There are going to be people who will give you their time to help you get there. It doesn't have to cost you anything. That's just, it's just beautiful, but it's hard, you know? I, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. There's no, uh, this is why I'm here right now with you because there's, I, I tried this on my own. Uh, exactly. And, and uh, I, I'm over, and I don't even know how many attempts, but it wasn't until I stuck my hand out and grabbed hands that were already extended to me. You know, yeah. it wasn't that I stuck my hand out and said, will anyone help me? The hands were already reached out. I just had to grab one. So um, now- I have this um, lovely, lovely moment, Jeff. So I just need to say when no, I am- go ahead. I sat in a meeting once thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to become me. I saw, I suddenly saw all these masks that I was wearing and I realized that I had to take all the masks off and I was going to become me. And- I was terrified, right? Because I thought that when I became me, people would run to the hills screaming at what they saw, right? At what they saw. That's what my head said. You take those masks off, you become you, people will run to the hills screaming because of what they see. I mean, whose head does that to somebody, right? For a start, whose head does that to somebody? But I took, I took my mask off. I took my armor off. I took all the walls down. I, I laid myself bare and went, I have to be me. If I am not me, I am not going to get this thing. And when I did that, I found God sat waiting for me going, lovely to have you here. I've been waiting for you. Welcome home. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I, I, I'm starting now to actually starting to like the person I see in the mirror for the first time in a long time. I, I did not like to uh, have to come face to face with him. And now yeah. I'm actually, you know, hey, it's good to see you this morning. Um, so the other one, now I come from an AA background, but um, this is, you know, this is non-denominational. I don't, mm -hmm. I, your support, I'm just glad people, but um, I'm going to throw it at you. Well, AA, yeah, but the whole God thing, I'm not there. Yep. Uh, and I, you know, I, I was there, I understand. And it's a huge stickler. Uh, but I, what, the only thing that bothers me about that is that there are people that are delaying or foregoing their sobriety because of uh, those three letters or the two yep. letters of AA. Uh, with those. So what is your, your advice there or thoughts there? So try as many different meetings as you can, right? Lisa has a fantastic expression. AA meetings are like pants. You have to keep trying them all on until you find the pair that fits. Try on, try on as many as you can. Look, look beyond the program if it will get you in there. I didn't do the program straight away. I, I did kind of step, I found God before I started doing the steps. So I kind of had my one, two, three bits and then found a sponsor. Um, go to the meetings, find the people who are like you in the meetings, because there will be somebody like you. There will be somebody whose beginning was just like yours. There will be somebody who doesn't do the God thing and, and just go with it. I didn't do it. I thought it was nonsense. You know, it was, it was a good, a good few months before I found one. Um, 
And I know lots of people who do AA, who don't do God, but have a higher power of their understanding. Some people will say it's the room. The people in the room is their higher power, right? Um, G-O-D stands for group of drunks, right? It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a religious God. And let's face it, you know, God, God was kind of taken over by religion. It can be what you want it to be. But it is more than it is more than me. My God is more than me because stuff has happened to me that is not just about energy fields. I I, I went from being, you know, Mrs. Richard Dawkins, God is just the greatest fabrication of mankind, to I have handed my life over to this being and this power because when, I, when I've done that, it works. But I would say go for what you need from it. Go from what you need from it. I, Take I think what people... you need, right? Because it is the connection. It is the community. Take what you need, but be open be open to listening to where it could take you and and realize and remember how desperate you are for what you where you're going desperation got me on my knees it was desperation mm. and fear i think people get so caught up and and i'm guilty of this too but of of trying to put a definition of god uh you know uh, a, 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 a a a physical description i don't care it, it's it is whatever it is, but I, I can't do this alone. Uh, I've tried it uh, with Jeff's um, superpower, and that uh, works oh so well. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I don't care. I don't. The definition doesn't mean anything to me. I'm just okay. open for um, any hand that's coming out. You know, and they, they say higher power, and I, I, I have, and yeah, I am a, I'm a, a God fearing man. I'm not going to deny it, but my higher powers are this room um tlc is a higher power to me uh the people you everyone on this thing anything with you with these people with the rooms i'm stronger than i am with just me alone when i'm with any of that i i uh, um a podcast uh, a, a book of inspiration those combined i'm more powerful with that than i am by myself so those are all higher powers so i don't yes you know the definition be nothing i i we got um megan wants to jump on if you want to say hi we will go over as long as louise can stay uh but i do have to ask you one that i'm getting um we're really starting to open the doors up and we're gonna do more shows about this but is trauma i'm hearing the word trauma of and I'm a I I am the howdy duty of recovery. I've never um, been in a ditch. Um, I've never been in jail. I I've never been to war. I I don't think I had trauma, but I'm starting to explore back in things that weren't front page news headline news traumas, but they were they were in the back of the paper. But they were stuff that affected me. That I looking back were reasons why. Not that I drank, but but they were things that when I drank, saw so, got solved. You know, my shyness, my um, uh, nervousness. I, I couldn't talk to girls without alcohol, and I found yep. that even though I drank for fun, I realized, hey, I this solves problems. Well, the the issue is that I my drinking took away my ability to handle problems like normal people do or non-drinkers do. I didn't, I lost the ability to cope with problems, to cope with um, anxieties. I, I drank them all away or drank at them immediately. And I lost the natural ability of how I'm supposed to manage those things. So all I did was bury them down and they just build and build and fester, yeah. even though I don't even see them because they're buried under so much stuff. They're there causing a lot of, so the trauma thing is huge. And I, I was thrilled to hear you mention that because that's something I really want to learn more about and discuss uh, down the road. Okay. So the, the thing, the key thing with trauma is that it's, it doesn't have to be a capital T. It can be a little T, right? Little T for trauma. And it's about the impact. Trauma is about the impact on some of something on us, not necessarily the thing itself. So it's how we, feel about a thing that happened to us or a circumstance and 
it, it doesn't have to be an abuse trauma. It can be a neglect trauma. It can be a time trauma. It can be about where we are as children needing to learn various things from the environment around us and that environment not being able to provide us with those lessons at the time at which we need them. And then we learn coping strategies that in the end, no longer serve us when we get older. How did is you how I look at mine. How did, and, you, um, how did you find yours, Louise? How did, how did you even develop? Because I didn't know that I had until weeks ago that I even, trauma was even a part of my life. And I'm still just learning this, but how did you discover that stuff? So it's not necessarily something I'd be comfortable to talk about on a live space. You can tell me later in private. No, that's okay. But, I just, what, what, but, what would you yeah, recommend well, then? I shared, what are, I shared it on TLC and I think I talked about it on TLC. Um, you can just go, what are paths that you would recommend for people to do if they want the to therapy, do that? Therapy, okay. therapy to help you uncover it. Because one of the things is, is that it comes out in the way we react to certain circumstances as a grown up. So as an adult, there might be certain things that I, re I respond to in a certain way, being completely vague, um, that aren't necessarily adult type behaviors mm -hmm. because I'm going back to my child behaviors because those are triggering circumstances. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It so does. There, there will be certain triggers and certain behaviors and certain characters that something will happen and I will find myself behaving in a way that makes me go, hang on a minute, <laughs> what am I doing? that's crazy I don't want to behave like this that's not like a proper adult person would respond and I have to go away and understand more about what was going on in that moment and understand where my reaction was coming from to then kind of have a conversation with myself about the fact that I don't need to be there anymore you know and um Jodie White I've done a couple of I've done some courses with Jodie White. She does a lot of stuff. It's called love addiction, but it's really about inner child work um, and and healing our trauma as children to reparent and love ourselves. So she does this thing where she has the wounded child, where there are very various behaviours that we hang on to as a wounded child. We then learn coping strategies, which are our adapted wounded child. But what we need to learn how to do is to love those two bring them together and find our functional adult self. And we had this fantastic moment where she did, um, we got to imagine our functional adult selves, right? And I, oh, that's a good spot. I, I kind of saw myself as Wonder Woman, which was just fabulous, right? I'm sat in this thing going, I can't, I can't be Wonder Woman. That's just crazy, right? That's crazy, isn't it? How ridiculous. <laughs> How ridiculous that I see my functional adult self as Wonder Woman. And then actually, do you know what? If my functional adult self is all about being calm, supportive, engaging, nurturing, why wouldn't that be Wonder Woman, right? Why wouldn't that be Wonder Woman? And how do I be more of my Wonder Woman part and less of my other parts by bringing those three together? And it, it's... It's being able to explore that in a space with other people where I can work it through, talk it through. Talking talking's the only way that therapy works for me. Writing helps a bit. Um, my book that I'm writing is a novel um, about a woman who needs to give up drinking, bizarrely. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff in that that is unpicking a lot of my deeper processing stuff that I need to kind of write it out, but I'm writing it out as a set of different characters, not just one. But it, it is about going back and opening the box with help and understanding what was going on for you at that time. Is there gonna be a chapter about your favorite Zoom interviewer uh, that you ever uh, <laughs> dealt with? You know, the, 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 you the wonder- the Wonder Woman thing, first off, uh, while everyone else was after Farrah Fawcett, I was in love with Linda Carter. So um, from Wonder Woman, as say she was my favorite. But the the powers that I've, you know, I never could have done what I'm doing now. I, I was scared to death to speak in public. So many things that just in this last year plus of my sobriety, these 
superpowers that I feel I that I had given up on. I, you know, I I had given up on the ability to achieve, um, and that's come back. To I, I had given up on the ability to dream, uh, and that's come back. That that's a biggie because I was just betterment was not even in my in my dream scope. Hope my dream was not to get caught or to go further in the hole today. That was my my dream for for today, and that is so freaking liberating to be able to dream on the positives and not just the negatives. That's huge. Um, Megan, I, um, she had her hand up. We, we've, I don't know if you're rushed, but you get a couple no, if you have. I'm here. Okay. Um, I'm, here. I've got eight. I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. So great. So uh, if you want to um, say hello or throw things, uh, throw your hand up and we'll bring in what we can for a little bit. Megan, go ahead. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Louise. Congratulations. Hello. Thank you. You're so inspiring. Oh my gosh. You know, I just was thinking on so many things that you said, but how when you took that test, you know, the test that we are asked. And it was the first time that I was really honest too, that I checked all the boxes. And I thought to myself, how, how can I be so highly functioning in so many parts of my life? And yet I'm not happy. And I really haven't been honest. And now all of a sudden I'm, you know, splurting it all out and, and laying my life out. Um, it was pretty, it was pretty cr incredible transformation for me. So I, I know that um, I, I can say now, um, well, you know, I've been waiting for you, Megan. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I um, I'm, I'm glad that I can look in the mirror and say that because I feel really whole now. And even though I thought I was before, um, you know, raised children, did stuff on my own, had the job. Um, nothing compares to the, the joy and the peace that I feel right now. So when Jeff asked earlier, what do you say to someone? It's like, don't you want this feeling? <laughs> it's so cool. So um, I, I'm so glad to be on with you this morning. Um, you're a hero, okay. Wonder Woman, to all of us who, who are listening. Um, and Jeff, thanks for... Um, making this happen and uh, congratulations. You know, me, Megan, I'll Thank throw you. this back at you though, is that don't you want this feeling? I couldn't relate to that feeling when I was drinking. The only feeling, I just didn't want to lose the feeling or that I got when I was drinking or I didn't want to have to face the feeling that I was fearing of living tomorrow without alcohol. So I didn't, I had trouble relating. It, it was not... It was almost goofy that I saw in, in, in Louise, I'm an AA, in, like when you came in, everyone's happy and joyous going, I'm so happy to be sober. And I was like, you're crazy. Okay. You are brainwashed beyond belief. I didn't believe it. And I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to look as goofy as they look to me at that point. As crazy as that is. Yeah, but we didn't know what it was. We didn't know what that feeling really was until really we were able to embrace it, you know, and, and understand it. It's, it's, it's better. Yeah. Glad to be home. Thanks, Megan. Mm -hmm. um, L Louise, the, the one you said your sponsor, I think after 12 years and had gone out, but, but you had said, I think that she had uh, three years that she had for three years had stopped going to meetings and, <laughs> Um, one that I hear a lot is suffering from burnout and I've done, I can do that with anything. And that scares the hell out of me because if I stop doing what I'm doing now, you know, with meetings or whatever, because that is the common, and it's not just an AA thing because you hear they stop going to meetings. Well, that can be, they can stop doing whatever it is your program is. So yeah. how do you, well, I don't want to keep going back to A because there's so many people that aren't involved in A, but in their recovery, just going, okay, I can't do another one of these. I, I'm, I got to do something. I, the, suffering from the burnout is what scares me. So how do we deal with that? When you say burnout, you mean as in going to too too much? Uh, it's just recovery it's lost. It's overload. I'm tired of it. It's just enough right. of it. I I've heard the same thing over and over again. It's 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 now become a chore versus you know for me. Uh, meetings are, I look forward to them, but now it's like, oh yeah. crap, I got to go to my five o'clock meeting. And that, I don't want to lose that. 
So hold, get somebody to hold you to account. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the sponsor role works in AA, but have somebody to hold you to account. You know, I, I sat down with my kids once and I said, if I ever, right, ever turn around to you and I say to you, do you know what? I think this not drinking nonsense is, is, is gone past now. I think I'm, I'm ready to maybe start again. You are to take my phone off me and you are to go through every single name that has AA next to it. And you are to ring them all up until somebody will come to my house now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Because, because that means I've lost it. So that's, that's my one thing is, you know, I've, I've got them on the hook. Um, but it's, it's about staying in, in the community. I, I stopped going. I thought I was doing okay. Life got busy. You know, this is about two years in. The only meetings I went to were when I was asked to share. So I spent about probably about eight months only hearing my own story. And my head went. My ego came back. There was loads of stuff. I was, I was just, I, I saw what was going on before I drank. And I'm really lucky. Which is why I, I now go to a meeting every week. And then I, and I had a, a dip a couple of years ago. I wasn't very well. Um, and I did 90 meetings in 90 days again, which I didn't do the first time around. So I think the only thing you can do is just be cognizant. You've got to be cognizant of it. You have to take responsibility for your own recovery. You know, it's that thing, isn't it? You can't do it alone. This is your thing. Only you can do it. You have to be cognizant of it. You have to hold yourself to account. You have to make a commitment. Because if you don't make it, like I didn't, it, it wanders off. It will wander off. And if uh, you I, find that you're doing too many, don't do not do the alcoholic thing of going from all to nothing. Just kind of rebase, rebase. And for me, I, a couple of times, I've just had to get back to basics of going, right, actually, everything else has to go. So if, I've, if I'm going into a space where it's all going wrong and I'm not well, everything else goes. My recovery is the last thing that goes, right? Everything else goes first. I would step away from my job, step away from my kids, step away from everything if I felt my recovery was under threat and I would go back to basics. The, the, the last thing and what scares me, what you just said, because you almost said the word that um, we all hate to hear, moderate. Moderate the meetings because moderation for me with alcohol was I'm going to cut back and not exceed 30 beers a day. That was moderation. That was the only moderation that worked for me was keep it under 30. Um, and that's, I, I'm definitely the all or nothing guy. That's, that scares me because I'm hundred percent or it's off, you know, and, and finding that balance is something I have to do. But it's also one of the things in recovery, isn't it? It's about learning new behaviors. So if we, for me, you know, if I sit, when I, when I first sat looking at kind of the whole step four thing I just did what what are the seven deadly sins and what are the seven behavior things that we need to be looking to do and it's stuff like patience and tolerance and harmony and actually if I if I proactively look at how I bring those into my life those are the things that have improved the way I live so I am changing how I deal with stuff and finding more balance rather than being this all or nothing person. I'm starting to get better at understanding where is the balance point. And then that comes in everything. That comes, that, that kind of just changes everything for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. All right. Last question, I promise. Uh, and this, I could go on for 38 hours, but um, I look at, the people that say I quit drinking and my life is still sucks. Um, and for me, my recovery is a two part phase. Phase one was I got to stop drinking. Uh, and I thought that was the only problem I had. I thought you take the beer away and magically my family, my job, my happiness, my health, everything is just going to be beautiful. And that wasn't the case. And it wasn't until I started working on the reasons that made me need to drink or have yep. to drink. So when you hear someone that says I quit drinking and life is still, I, I want to ask, what are you, you know, where is your, what phase? are you doing differently? Yeah. What, what, is, what is the stage two? So what are your answers yeah. there? Just. So it's about finding 
finding the things that used to trigger drinking. So, you know, my work would trigger my drinking. I'd come home from work stressed. So I would lead into a glass of wine. Right. How am I no longer going to come home from work stressed? I have to stop coming home from work stressed. End of. And if I sit in my working day and there are things in my job that are creating too much stress, I have to change the way I do those. So initially for me, I am, um, I, <laughs> I just used to delegate everything to other people. So as a project manager, there are always people in your team who want to do more than just their job and who want stretch opportunities. So I would give all most of my job to other people for those stretch opportunities. So I have a team of people who are growing and being nurtured but actually are helping me because they're reducing my stress levels. So it's about, it's about understanding where your stresses come from. When you're reaching for that wine bottle or when you're craving that wine, what has been happening to you and what have you been doing that has triggered that? I mean, this is one of the reasons why in recovery, they say don't make any changes, don't enter into new relationships, don't do new jobs, you know, do all actually get used to living your life the way it is now. Because adding stress and adding change actually is, is a big trigger. It's a big trigger for people. Um, and it also gives you know it gives you the opportunity to look at the bits in your life that you need to be working on to actually make not make necessarily make better but to be able to do in a way that is more you so that you are then triggered less. Louise, thanks so much for joining us. Um, stick around, we're gonna um, end the broadcast, but just go into the private uh, extra innings if anyone does wanna just say hi or check in or whatever. So, um, but uh, you have been such a massive help uh in my journey um and i think for, for you know inspiration and hope i know those are overused but um it, i just see what i could be and that's awesome it's the best so thank you for for sharing my pleasure you're Absolutely amazing my pleasure all thank right you. everyone um we're out of here i'll be back uh tuesday evening we got a, a couple of really really good stuff coming up our own kathy is gonna um Next Sunday, we've got uh, Amy Dresner is going to be on uh, Sunday evening at eight o'clock Eastern telling her story, which is going to be crazy. Uh, so get your uh, the earmuffs for the kids that you don't want to hear because the, the four letter words will be a flying, um, unlike Louise's uh, meetings. But no, so thanks so much, everyone. And uh, also we've got, um, yeah, we got a big week. So we'll have stuff posted on the sites. Thanks everyone and uh, be safe and have a great weekend. We'll see ya.